Tozer <laughs> always amazed me because one of the first books that I ever read by him was, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but I remember that in the introduction, he made a interesting statement about being a prophet of God. And when I was a, when I got saved, I was a Jesus freak, and so I had no upbringing. I had no knowledge of that there could be prophets or that people could actually claim that and name that or whatever you want to call it and actually be one because I had seen after I got saved so many people on Christian television and many other different venues and places where they claim to be things and do things that because I worked behind the scenes so often I saw more than I probably should have and maybe knew more than I probably wanted to know in those days when my faith was first being formed and I didn't realize or recognize that men are fallible but God is not so there are genuine articles out there but later as the Lord led me onward in my Christian walk when I began to uh, be less skeptical of the church and more accepting that God had worked through the ages through men of God then I began to look at church history and I began to realize that God himself has worked through men and women and donkeys <laughs> and me and you and that he is the one that we listen to when a person speaks for instance like if I'm reading this and something inspires you it's not me that you're listening to it's actually God God responds to God so the Holy Spirit inside you responds to God the Father speaking through me as though I were Jesus, meaning Jesus is living inside me, and we have a trinity, so to speak, of seeing, hearing, and believing. It's kind of fascinating, and it's a long-winded study on it that can get real depthful. But the bottom line is, is that God speaks. All you need to do is listen. One way or another, he's going to get your attention. So today, my attention is turned towards Tozer, who was called a prophet of God, and I was always fascinated by him. Boy, every time that I read him, I'm amazed because it sounds like God is talking directly to me. We all stand daily in the mercy of God. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 Although God wants his people to be holy as he is holy, he does not deal with us according to the degree of our holiness, but according to the abundance of his mercy. Honesty requires us to admit this. We do believe in justice, and we do believe in judgment. We believe the only reason mercy triumphs over judgment is that God, by a divine, omniscient act of redemption, fixed it so man could escape justice and live in the sea of mercy. The justified man, the man who believes in Jesus Christ, born anew, and now a redeemed child of God, lives in that mercy always. The unjust man, however, the unrepentant sinner, lives in it now in a lesser degree, but the time will come when he will face the judgment of God. Though he had been kept by the mercy of God from death, from insanity, from disease, he can violate that mercy and turn his back on it and walk into judgment. If he does, then it's too late. Let us pray with humility and repentance, for we stand in the mercy of God. What an example we have set for us by the life and faith and spirit of the old Puritan saint Thomas Hooker as his death approached. Those around his bedside said, Brother Hooker, you are going to receive your reward. No, no, he breathed. I go to receive mercy. Wow. Isn't that an awesome thought? To take to the bank and say you know what I want to withdraw all my stored up blessings that I think I'm going to get because in reality I think and it's always been my opinion that when you see in the book of Revelation the four and twenty elders casting down their thrones and people talk to me about they're going to go to heaven and get their just rewards I always think that the just rewards is that they get mercy and they get love and they get forgiveness and they get to be in the presence of God and that in reality when we get there we're going to give back anything that we might have had and that we're not going to want anything except to be with Jesus. Now, people can argue. 
and people do, and people will argue with me a lot, <laughs> and they love to do that, and I always come back with a scripture, and I'll share with them bluntly why I believe that, you know, we don't have all these magnificent mansions and structures and everything else that's quote-unquote kingdom living for some people in heaven, but that the reality is, is that God has prepared a place for us and that where he is, we will be with him. And I don't see that as being in some mansion in the sky with DVDs and iPhones and modern technology, but I see it in a place where God takes his rest and we are beside him. I imagine that in New Jerusalem there is a place for each and every one of us. And we shall abide in it and travel with it. Who knows? Through the universe. But mercy is why we can be forgiven, move forward, and not fall apart when we sin today, and you will, and we sin tomorrow, and you will, and we sin the next day, and you will. But it's God's mercy that reached out to us and said, I will forgive all your iniquities and pardon all your sins. And so, Though it's a terrible price to pay that Jesus gave his life for us, in one way, it's a magnificent witness of mercy. And it's an even greater demonstration of love. Oh, how the Father loves you. And how he loves me.